that's actually one of the reasons why um, I wanted to do this because you're asking for help and my um, YouTube videos get some really brilliant comments. I've also had oh, loads of great yeah. leads and great ideas from so many of the viewers. It's a real way of sharing. Oh, you much on your own. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. anyway, anyway, I've started recording, so I'm just going to do like a little introduction. Um, I've not done this before, as people will know. Uh, I couldn't refuse the offer from this lovely woman called Von Galt. Is it? Is that right? I, I don't really know. Von Galt. Yeah. Um, like and who is John Galt? <laughs> hey, what, sorry? Like who is John Galt? The oh, book? oh, I don't know that. No, <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm not into these things. I, I left the mainstream entertainment world years ago. But um, yeah, your email was just so fascinating. When you li listed all the things that you wanted to talk about, I was like, oh, this is brilliant because it's like Lemuria related stuff, isn't it? Um, oh, and yeah. A lot thought, of the folklore is. And the Plain of Jars, when you talked about the Plain of Jars, because I visited those in Laos and it's sensational and not talked about enough online. So I really wanted to just do that. So this is Ron Gold. She is a very interesting woman. I've written down, like I was having a look at your Amazon page and some of the books you've written. I'm going to read some out. 30 Reasons to Adopt a Dog coloring book, Barbados Vacation guide coloring book and then buddha's guide to manifest parallel realities using the four noble truths and eightfold path in the age of consciousness so you really got quite a <laughs> a, a non-specific skill set if we can put it that way so um i'm basically just going to let you talk and i'm going to jump in with questions as i say, i've not done this before so i would appreciate feedback because it's something we've been thinking about. Actually, me and Jay have been thinking about it for the last year. Um, so here we go. This might be the start of it. So please introduce yourself, convince people that you know what you're talking about, and then we'll just go from there. And I'll jump in with questions whenever and uh, whenever is necessary. Let's put it that way. Yes. Um, Nick, I love you. Thank you so much for interviewing me and helping me crowdsource leads for my my recent project. Um, Sure. pyramids megaliths and tribal folklores of asia i plan on making a series where i go from asia to europe to um the americas to africa and up to the middle east and there's a reason for that pathway it's based off the folklores that i'm following mm -hmm. so um, a little bit about my background for your audience is that um, I'm actually a normal working mom. I work in IT here in Seattle, Washington. And aside from working um, a professional job in digital marketing, I also write books. Um, it is my love. It's actually my meditation. So, um, yeah, so I enjoy writing books on pretty much any topic that is interesting to me. Um, and so that's why a lot of the topics in my um, author page on Amazon kind of runs the gamut. But one of the things that's always been very interesting to me is metaphysics um, because I've been studying Buddhism my whole life. I was raised in the Buddhist um, tradition um, as a, you know, Laotian. Um, but from that, I actually also love folklore because a lot of um, ancient folklore going all the way back to Lemuria is wrapped into Buddhist folklore and Laotian folklore. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I've been raised in a lot of folklore as well as Buddhism. And, um, and so that always interests me into archeology. span So that's a little bit about my background um, into the space. And the reason why I started this project to write a book series on pyramids, megaliths, and tribal folklores was inspired from um, my travels to Laos. So my family, predominantly my mother, spent a lot of time and efforts funding the build of different Buddhist monasteries in Laos, um, especially making sure that the artwork that is being funded is, um, you know, good quality. And a lot of the artwork in Buddhist monasteries throughout Southeast Asia and especially Laos have a lot of folklore about the local oral traditions of the um, Southeast Asians and Laotians going all the way back to the mega flood of Lemuria. 
Mm-hmm. And so um, how I got started in this is, is many years ago, in 2012, I had some time to go on one of my mother's trips to visit one of her recent um, monasteries that she finished co- construction and um, renovation of in Laos, in the um, Tampa State area of the area where my parents grew up in. And when I went over there, I started to look at, um, I started to look at different monuments around the area and I started to look at the artwork in the monasteries that my mother was helping build the fund of. And I started to look at these monasteries and I started seeing some similar common themes. A lot of the folklore go even further beyond known knowledge of Buddhism. Um, and a lot of the folklore that's also documented because much of Buddhism is also inspired by the Vedas of um, Hinduism, which go back 7,000 years, according to Regia, mm-hmm. um, or the Reg Vedas. And so some of those, those folklore about um, Vishnu and um, Shiva also wrapped into Buddhism. So it's that, that art- artwork is also wrapped into the monasteries. And one of the things that really caught me, um, caught my interest was that there is a distinction between folklore and oral history. And we have to make this distinction. For, for the peoples in the area, for a very, very long time, many of them were very illiterate. And, um, and if they got an education like my father, they would get an education through the monasteries. So for thousands of years, the Buddhist monasteries were actually universities that would provide a free education to anybody who wanted to get an education. And so many men, um, maybe some women would go into these monasteries to get a free education. And that's where my father learned to um, learn to read and write English. And um, as part of the tradition, they also document the oral history of folklore is told over time from generation to generation in the artwork, because that's how they document the history of the people, is in the artwork, and that's how they pass that tradition on, is through the artwork, because they're illiterate, Mm -hmm. okay? So when you look at a lot of these monastery um, artwork, and you see artwork that go all the way back to Lemuria, go all the way back to the broad times of... um, how do you know? So you say you've, you've seen artwork that goes all the way back to Lemuria. How do you know that? How, have you seen? Because, um, because the monks say this is the oral tradition of the area and they go back more than 10,000 years ago. And the monks typically are just, uh, are being, they're passing along oral tradition from one generation to another. And so they're making sure that whenever something impactful happens to the area or in the spiritual canon, it gets documented in the artwork. And that's why you see a lot of mega flood artwork um, all over monasteries in Southeast Asia. Well, not just Southeast Asia, it's it's all over the planet, isn't it? The flood flood story is just everywhere, basically. Yeah, and I find that too. Um, I'm for for me. I'm gonna focus on Asia, and I'm moving up. But you're you're definitely right. It's all over, and it goes back more than ten thousand years ago. Mm-hmm. So, um, so when I was looking at the artwork, I was like, "Hmm, that's interesting." Um, you know, this goes way back. And when I asked the monks, you know, how far does this go back? They they typically say much, much older than 10,000 years ago. We don't know exact, we stopped counting. It's much, much older. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's, that's interesting. And then um, when I was at my mother's village, just getting to know the area and just kind of bumping around the different um, monasteries and the, the old monuments, I came across um, just different blonde monks. And, and, you know, blonde, blonde monks, the Northern Laos, is a, there's a tribe called the Hmong, and blonde monks are actually very common in that area, uh, and they kind of crop up every couple uh, of generations. And the folklore around the blonde Laotians is that um, at one point they were blonde, blue-eyed Asians, and they came from um, a distant land that was ravaged by a flood. Or possibly, and, could it be a, a different planet? 
because you hear the the Nordics and um, you know there's stories of Africa being visited by tall blonde people as well. I know Credo Mutt was talked a lot about it. So um, yeah, distant distant land. We'll put it like right. that. <laughs> yeah. So that's just the folklore. So again, this is just the folklore. So mm -hmm. um, so that's the folklore. And basically, another folklore is that during tribal times, during tribal feuds, there was um, a lot of fighting between the dynasties of China at the time and the Hmong tribe lost. They were, they were trying to get sovereignty um, for their tribe. And they lost and as a result of losing, the dynasty of China at the time, according to the folklore, came down and killed every single blonde Hmong that they could find, even the babies. They didn't want them to reproduce. And so what happens is the only, the only Hmong that survived were the ones whose hair did not stay blonde permanently or their eyes kind of changed to um, brown because it wasn't dominant. And so they would pass on genes that way. And every couple of generations, a blonde, blue-eyed Hmong Laos baby would be born in the family. Um, and like my mother um, was one of them, and her blonde, blue eyes kind of turned turn, um, as she got older. My cousin is one of them. Um, so it, it crops up here and there. So there might be something to that folklore as to why um, there isn't a whole tribe of blonde, blue-eyed Hmong. But it pops up ever so often, every couple of generations. So I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. And then I went to the plain of jars in Laos, and I saw this huge valley of jars that mm -hmm. are as tall as me, some bigger, some with lids on it, and I thought that was very interesting. And, and there's some, um, sorry to interrupt, that's just the way it's gonna have to be, I think, but um, they've also got some humanoid carvings on some of these lids, haven't they? And Yeah. So um, yeah, th there, there are different artwork as well. And according to the folklore of the Plain of Jars, uh, according to the locals, and, and there was a young amateur archeologist that came through and found a couple of human remains in some jars and thought, well, these are all funerary jars. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not the case for all the others. It's a whole valley of them. Yeah. And um, according to the folklore of the locals, it was the remnants of a giant party from giants who um, were celebrating winning a war. And they came to Laos and they had this big, basically big Super Bowl party. And, um, and these are the remnants of their, their drinking cups from the party. Um, so that's the folklore for the Plain of Jars. So I thought that was interesting. Okay, a valley of giants. Mm -hmm. And then I went to another... Um, ancient temple called the Tomu Monument. And according to the folklore, because there's a lot of folklore in Laos, and I'm looking at all these folklores going, oh, this is interesting. And the folklore in Laos on the Tomu Monument is, um, is a tribute of Shiva. So Shiva, according to the folklore, had left to go to Mount Kalesh in Tibet mm -hmm. to go study um, about enlightenment from the wise men up there. Which looks like a and, pyramid from certain angles, doesn't it? That's, it's like the, the huge, huge or kind of pyramid shaped mountain basically, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, it, it does look like it. Um, and actually we'll get into that a little bit later too, because that's where I end up um, ending is in Tibet of my, um, my research so far. Oh, cool. But anyway, so the Tolu Monument, according to the folklore, um, and there's a lot of monuments to different um, Vedic um, gods and goddesses in Laos as well. That kind of gets wrapped into Buddhism. Because again, a lot of Buddhism is, has some influence from the Vedics. Mm -hmm. um, but Shiva had went for a couple months to learn about enlightenment in Mount Kalesh. And when he came back, his wife... Um, had killed herself because she had heard a rumor that he had passed on. Now, she lived for a thousand years, according to the folklore, waiting for him. And um, the original Tomu Monument Temple that he had come back and built, um, he had saw an, uh, a younger woman that he believed was the reincarnation of his wife. Mm -hmm. And so they fell in love, got married, and he built this um, 
this temple monument uh, to her. But that temple monument had fallen and a remnant replica, a smaller version of it, is at the Tomu monument in Laos. And I actually sent you a picture of that. And it's very small. I actually have to kneel a little bit um, to get through the doors. And the reason why it is, according to the folklore, a lot of the Laos people say the newer monuments that you see around here are shorter to reflect the height of the people now. But the older monuments, the older temples are much higher in height because people were more much taller back then. There's a reason why the heights of the doors are so different from the older temples versus the newer temples. Mm. And so I thought that was interesting. So um, there's a folklore about um, going to Mount Kailash and time running so much faster at Mount Kailash than it is when you come off the mountain. And about this woman, Shiva's wife, who lives so much longer than what we normally would live. Um, and that these people of ancient times were so much taller, almost like giants. So um, I went to look at another temple called Vat Pu Temple in Laos. And it, um, it faces Angkor Wat. Um, and it's supposed to be a sister temple to Angkor Wat. When you leave Angkor Wat in Cambodia, you go straight to Laos. And it's, it's kind of a replica of Angkor Wat. Mm -hmm. And when I went there, it's an older temple. The doorways are much higher. So maybe the folklores are actually accurate that the older temples are taller than the right. newer temples. So there's some, <laughs> um, some like actual evidence to suggest that what's in the writing is true. Because that's one problem I have with, yeah. like, I, I really like to listen and read about the folklore, but I have such a, a problem with it because you don't know how much, um, how much the story's changed over time. Like you said, most of it is like oral, like traditions passed down. And you imagine, well, I personally imagine like stories told on a campfire and someone who's a dad like myself, like and exaggerating the story. Oh, she lived for a thousand years. And then it becomes like embedded in the folklore. So for me, I struggle to take it seriously, if it, to put right. it that way. So it's really important to find like actual, like, bits of evidence in these temples and things, isn't it? And I, I have- might, might prove it correct, might not. You never know. Uh, the, I mean, the folklore is, again, like you say, are oral tradition. And when you pass, like, play the telephone, yeah. some bits could kind of, you know, differentiate. But as we, but as we, I go through my trip to Laos, I start seeing the folklores, um, playing on each other going, hmm, this is interesting. So anyways, when I was in Vat Pu, well, you walk through all the way up to the mountain top, okay? And you walk up to the very top and there's this straight cutout into the granite mountain. It's like a straight cutout. Um, and there, you know, there's some, you know, right angle pillars up there as well. And that's where one, that was where a enlightened monk would meditate and reside was in this cutout. But I found that interesting that that cutout looked a lot like the cutout in the Yangsheng Quarry in China. Okay. But so anyway, so I'm looking at all these going, hmm, there's all these folklores about giants in this area. There's all these folklores about this mega flood over 10,000 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. There's all these folklores about the original cosmology um, and aesthetics of the Hmong tribe. So I went home and I get my DNA ancestry results from that test. So I, I took a test before I left. And when I got home, I got the results and it's not what I thought it was going to be. I thought, okay, well maybe um, the blonde blue eyes that crop up in my family, because we're all Asian, um, maybe there's a little bit of French influence because it's French colony at one point. Maybe there's a little, um, you know, Russian, because you know, up in the northern China mm -hmm. area, maybe maybe there's some kind of Caucasian in my DNA. And when the DNA report came through, there's zero percent Caucasian in my DNA. Absolutely no Caucasian. Zero. I'm fourteen percent Polynesian, according to DNA ancestry report. Uh, um, I think a couple, like one or two percent um, African, which everybody is. And then the rest of it is sheer Asian. 
it's just Asian. And so I actually called Ancestry um, Company and I said, I think you have the wrong data. I think you mixed me up with somebody else. Um, and they looked it up and they said, nope, nope, nope. That's exactly your results. Uh, we don't deviate. We've done this thousands and thousands of times. This is your DNA. You're 14% Polynesian. The rest is Asian. And I said, well what, well, what about the blonde blue eyes in my family that crop up every couple of generations? And they said, well, you know, we have seen this of other people who are of the Hmong tribe in northern Laos. I'm like, oh, yeah, I am northern Laos. Okay. So then I go to my mother and I ask her, um, mom, do you know that we're Hmong? And she said, of course. I said, well, why did you tell me? She's like, well, it's, it's something that you don't really talk about in Laos because of the CIA secret war. Okay. And, and so if you're Hmong or a Hmong lineage living in Northern Laos, um, you don't talk about that because you don't want to be a marker for problems. Mm -hmm. Because the Hmong tribe has been trying for, for thousands of years, according to the folklore, to try to get sovereignty. They're kind of like Native Americans in their own country. Do you have racist negative blood or do you have like psychic abilities or something? And was the Hmong tribe kind of famous for that? It sounds like, um, you know, they always try and burn the witches at the stake like they do. And for me, they were, they're just trying to eradicate any kind of like sense of connection to each other and any kind of psychic connections at all. So I wonder if there's anything like that in the, in the Hmong people. Um, that I'm not sure. Okay. So, yeah. So um, I, know they, I, know they, I know that they have some belief in shamanism. Mm -hmm. um, which is a belief system that's been held through their, um, for a very, very long time. A lot of the Hmong are actually Buddhists nowadays. Oh, what? Sorry? So, like, like my Buddhists. They're actually oh. Buddhists. Right. Like, like myself, I'm, I'm Buddhist. So, um, the you know, normal Laos people. But this is one of the reasons why my family um, have political asylum here in the U.S. because we are Hmong and my father helped... Um, with the CIA secret war in writing documents to help families afflicted by um, the CIA secret war to get out of Laos and get a political asylum where they're going to be safe. But if you still have family members and people of the Hmong tribe that still live there, you just don't talk about it because you don't want to cause problems for them. So that's why I, my whole life, never knew that I was of the Hmong tribe of Northern Laos. Right. But, um, but also, it was not a shock to my mom about the blonde blue eyes because she said that's normal in Hmong as well. Okay. Um, and, so, and so I was like, well, why didn't you tell us that? She's like, again, we just don't talk about it. It's just one of those things that, that is what you are. And we don't want to um, draw attention because tensions in Northern Laos between the Hmong tribe and the surrounding era has always been, um, since tribal times, kind of um, complicated. So what is it, what is you being Hmong, how has that solidified your, um, your trains of thoughts and your research and your thinking? Well, so I then asked my mother and my aunt, well, what about the 14% Polynesian? And they said, we don't know where that came from. Because everybody in our family, as long as they can remember, has always been Northern Laos. They have no clue where the 14% Polynesian in our DNA comes from. Hmm. so then there was that mystery so then i so then i thought okay so this mystery since my uh, vacation to laos to visit one of my mom's recent monasteries is really thickening so then i decided to look at the folklores a little bit more in depth and I looked at the artwork that i collected from the monasteries to and i sent a picture of one of the um artwork that has the mega flood and um According to the Buddhist folklore of the area, over 10,000 years ago, like way over 10,000 years ago, there was this mega flood that hit um, the area. And there was uh, an ancient advanced civilization in um, the Pacific, um, what they would call Lu, Mu or Lemuria or whatever you want to call it. So there's this ancient advanced civilization. And basically, this mega flood came in, and the only people who were survived were the ones who made it up to the mountains, like Tibet, like China, like the tops of different islands, like Hawaii, Australia, different places. Everybody else who didn't make it up to the mountains 
perish in the flood. That's the folklore. And that's the folklore that's been depicted in all these monasteries, Buddhist monasteries in Southeast Asia. Wherever you go, it's the same mega flood folklore. And so how so is this in the artwork? Is it just, um, is it obvious? Is there like a big wave coming and crashing down on, how, how does it, what does it look like in the artwork? Well, I sent you a picture of um, the artwork from my mom's um, monastery. And, and it, it basically is people in the water. There's like sharks and people are drowning. And there is, it looks like a deity carrying another person that they're rescuing. And then there is a boat um, with, with um, stuff on it. And according to the folklore, some people were tipped off about the flood that was coming through. And so they put their possessions that they needed to survive on these boats, along with the people that was going to be traveling with them. Um, everybody else didn't, didn't believe that the, the, the flood was going to come through. So somehow they got tipped off into this major flood that was going to come through. And so how the folklore goes is there's not just one boat, but there's many of boats that descended from this area. And when the flood came through, these people were seafaring people for a while, traveling around trying to find land. And where they landed, according to the Buddhist folklore, were the tops of these mountains. Now, when the water receded, everybody started to go back into the valleys and reside and live out their life and start their civilization over again. That's the folklore that's been wrapped into artwork in Buddhist monasteries in Laos and other places. So what I started to do was go, okay, let's take a look at this folklore because now I'm really intrigued. So I started from supposedly the top of where Lemuria was supposed to be in the, in the Pacific. I'm just starting in Asia. I'm going, my, working my way around. So the first, the first thing I do is I go up to, um, I go up uh, on the very tip of the Polynesian island. So according to this folklore, there should be some kind of pyramid or megalith um, on the top of all these islands if it is actually a part of this folklore of Lemuria and the mega flood. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the first thing I go to is I go to Tonga and I look at Tonga and I'm looking around. Okay. Is there some evidence? And yes, there is evidence in Tonga. They have the, what they call the Polynesian Stonehenge, which is the Ha Amanga Maui uh, megalith. Mm. Okay. And so I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. And Ha Amanga is a long word for Hmong. Right. Jesus. Okay. Ha Amanga, Hmong. Remember, yeah, yeah. I'm percent Polynesian, and nobody in my family knows where that came from. So, okay, fine, no problem. So I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I look further into Tonga, and they have the Langi Pyramid platforms near the lost city of Mu'a. All right? So that's interesting. They have a pyramid platform near a city called Mu'a, short for Mu, or Lemuria. Mm -hmm. So as Tonga, so I'm like, well, that's interesting. That 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 hits right there. Let's go down the Pacific Islands. So I go down to the next one, and I go to um, I go to in sorry, no, I think did I go to Indonesia? Yeah, I go to Indonesia. I might be dotting down a little bit here, but so I go to Indonesia, and um, in Indonesia they have what they call the Bata Valley. A megalithic jars. They pretty much look like the plain of jars in Laos. They're the giant sized jars. Now according to the folklore of Indonesia, the megalithic jars were used as um, for, for giants of the royalty to bathe in. Okay, that's according to the folklore. But in the Bala, Bata Valley of megalithic jars, they also have statues that are very tall and giant size. Yeah, and they, they are not dissimilar to uh, the ones in Easter Island, aren't they? Yep, yep. And, um, and they, they are very, very similar in design. But the funny thing is that if you look at these statues, I think I sent you a picture of one as well. If you look at these statues, they look like gestures and their hands are around their, um, their genitals. 
They're, hey. And so the folklore, according to the Indonesians, is that these giant megalithic statues are kind of gestures that are fornicating themselves or playing themselves are supposed to be facing where the um, palace of the king was. Well, and it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be a joke. It's supposed to make him laugh. Like you, it's supposed it's to make him laugh. laugh. You're talking about statues <laughs> wanking, aren't you? Is that, is that, <laughs> am I mistaken? Yeah, no, he's like wanking himself. And okay. there's plenty of these megalithic statues all over the Bata Valley of megalithic jars in Indonesia. And they're basically just kind of playing with themselves. And the whole folklore is that during, during the time when they had a palace, the royalty were a royalty of giants and there was a, a, a war they went and the, the king, according to the folklore, got a lot of anxiety. And so they put up these, these giant size um, gesture type statues all over the island <laughs> facing, facing the palace so that the giant king can look at these fornicating, you know, um, statues okay. and just laugh. Okay. okay. <laughs> so they, hang on, hang on. So your theory is, is that these statues are playing with themselves to make the king laugh. Is that because right? Was That's not my theory. That's the folklore. <laughs> maybe they, the maybe they were just watching a movie. I mean, I can't, maybe, I can't admit, like, maybe. I can't, I cup my ball sometimes when I'm watching a movie. You know, they're like little teddy bears down there. <laughs> <laughs> But that's just the folklore. That's the folklore okay. of Indonesia. That's right. how they. That's how, when I talk to some people in Indonesia, they're like, "That's the folklore." He's <laughs> actually playing himself just to make the king laugh. How do you know what to take seriously and what to just think? You know, you know, you just tell the folklore as it is. You okay, take, right. You just so you don't take them all seriously. You just you just tell the folklore as it is. Okay. Um. But yeah, and that's why I'm collecting folklore through this project just to tell the folklore. Yeah. I don't sugar. I just this is what they tell me, and this is this is what the folklore are. Okay. So these giant statues predominantly face the same direction, and they're all fornicating themselves. And the folklore is to make the king laugh because there was a war of giants going on. Yeah, that's right. the folklore. Okay, that's why they I'm all look like <laughs> <laughs> Can you can you can you tell me? I'm dying to talk about like the dolmen on the island of Sumba. I was on the island of Sumba um a really cool and remote place and i did not know there were dolmen there and i'm really when i read that in your uh, what you sent me in the email i was so pissed off because god i was there for ages and i was bored doing nothing if i'd known there was a thousand dolmen i would have filmed some of them oh yeah yeah so i moved from the megalithic jars and statues of indonesia and i collected their folklores and there's some more folklores but um that's what you know i'm just touching on a couple of folklores I've collected so far. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm just following the Buddhist folklore of the mega flood of Lemuria. So then I go to the Sumba Island, uh, you know, small island uh, out of Indonesia. And there's yeah. thousands of dolmen tombstones in Sumba. I think I sent you a picture of that as well. Yeah. And they're megalithic and they're large. Now, th what they have done is they've used it for, um, you know, kind of graves. But the fact that they had thousands of this on their island and they're all megalithic, yeah. um, it, it says something. And, um, and according to the folklore, the people that, the original people that were in these dolmen graves are very tall. Um, then I also go to um, Nias Island, which is also in Indonesia. And, and Nias is actually an active culture of megaliths. They actually, um, they still practice some of the megalithic traditions of using dolmens. And what they do, what now they say that their ancient ancestors use different means to create megalithic structures, but They've forgotten all of that, and what they do now is just you know carry it like just manual labor carried around. But the Nias, the Nias Island, they um, they have a folklore of an ancient um, in in tribal times. There used to be lots of fights um, between the between different royalty in the islands for sovereignty for power, and um, what they ended up doing over time is they would have this kind of a challenge 
on who can jump these megalithic stones, who can jump over it. And whoever can jump over it would win the, the, the championship. So it, it, mm. it, from tribal times, um, it's turned into kind of like a, like a running man or uh, not burning man, but it's turned into a competition of hurdles, hurdling a hurdle. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so in modern times, even today, this tribe has a tradition in the Neos islands of is a rite of passage for young men to, to jump over these large megalithic stones. And if they get old enough to jump over it, then they're finally a man. Wow. Okay. But this is carried over from ancient times, this tradition yeah. from the tribal folklore of, uh, um, a war between giants. But they, are they saying time. that that's what they were built for? Or they're just like, they, they were already there and then they kind of adopted that into their ways of living? Right. They were already there. So, yeah, yeah so they adopted it. So, um, so that's the Neos Islands. So I was like, okay, the Neos Islands are very interesting. So then I go to um, the Philippines. And I don't, I don't actually know. Before I go to the Philippines, I do one last search for a pyramid in Indonesia. And I did find a pyramid, and it's called Ganang Padang. Yeah, it's old it's as well. 25,000 year old, according yeah. to Carbon Gaming, at least 25,000 year old step pyramid. Mm -hmm. And they found um, through research um, that there is a hollow shaft that goes all the way down the mountain, and they want to send something down there to take a look at what's in the bottom of this pyramid to see mm -hmm. what, why does it have a hollow shaft. Um, and so they're kind of going through some issues with the government because they don't want to break it. So, um, but they did do a little bit of excavation to find that it is one of the oldest step pyramids on earth that they found so far. So there's right. a pyramid in Indonesia. So, okay, I'm following this Buddhist folklore about the mega flood of Lemuria. So far, I'm kind of hitting every island that is a megalith and a, and a, and a pyramid. Mm -hmm. So Indonesia, check. I get to the Philippines. And in the Philippines, um, you have the chocolate hills of the Philippines. And I sent you a picture of the chocolate hills. And they're these huge uh, kind of conical type of um, hills. They're really big hills. And there's just like a whole valley of these really sharp hills. Um, and it's not a natural formation. Um, and... It's a tourist attraction now, so you can kind of look at the valley and see all these thousands of conical, huge hills. Um, so the chocolate hills of the Philippines, according to the folklore of the Philippines of the local people, the chocolate hill is a result of a war between giants. Aye. Two giants fought with each other by throwing rocks, and these rocks collected up and made these very sharp, conical type of hills all over the valley. Wow. Anyway, these two giants eventually settled the differences and they left the island, according to the folklore, without cleaning up their mess. <laughs> and they went somewhere else to go party and celebrate winning the war. So where have I heard this folklore of a, a set of giants partying after winning a war? Laos? Laos, the plain of jars. That was a guess. I didn't know. That, yeah, that's that a bit of jars. And where okay. did I hear this folklore in another island of a giant's type of royalty king who needed those gestures fornicating themselves to make him laugh because there was a war going on? That, that was in Indonesia, the megalithic jars of statues and jars. Remember those statues that were kind of touching themselves to make him laugh? Mm -hmm. That folklore? In Indonesia. So these folklores start kind of playing at each other and they're from completely different islands and different sections of Asia. So these chocolate hills in Philippines, have they done any scanning of these or any excavations? Have they found any artifacts here? No, they haven't. It's just a tourism attraction. Because these and really look like are, um these look like mounds. These look like uh they're like huge. silvery they're hill. Huge. But this is as you say, it looks like, well, from the photos, there's hundreds of them for sure. And you say that there's a lot. It's a more. whole valley. And when mm. you, and they're not small. When you stand, they're hills. They're hills. Um, and they call it the chocolate hills because in the summertime, it, um, the, it turns brown. The grass turns brown. That's why they call it chocolate hills. Mm. So that's the chocolate hills of the Philippines. And that's the tribal the folklore around how those 
um, thousands of conical hill sized hills were created was this the remnants of, of of a war between giants throwing rocks at each other and the rocks would collect up and create these formations mm. so when you go there you basically have to stand on the park's platform to get a nice aerial view of all these hills so i'm like okay chocolate hills of philippines done the, something megalithic there mm -hmm. so then um i go to the next island and I'm kind of dotting down the folk the buddhist folklore about the mega flood of lemuria so according to the lemurian folklore documented in all these buddhist temples um the people who survived and 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 try to start off their civilization again were living in the top of these mountains okay so there's got to be some evidence if that's you know somewhat true this folklore so i go over to easter island and i see of course we're familiar with the moa statues of rapa nui uh, and those statues they found in recent years aren't just heads but they have full bodies and they're still excavating that also in rapa liti i think it is there's a pyramid fortress there as well and then on easter island they have it they call it the vinapu megalithic walls and they just started excavating it and they basically they haven't gone down to the bottom of where these walls are. They're still excavating it. But these wow. walls are huge. They nice. look like the walls in Peru. Okay. Well, they're, they're a lot of the, mega, the rocks and everything. Yeah, the, the rocks that, go, that are really like airtight, um, perfect formations, all that. But these megalithic mm. walls, they just uncovered it recently, and they're still digging in, and, and it, they don't know how far it goes down. These megalithic walls that look like a lot of other megalithic walls around the world that are perfect um, juxtaposition to each other, perfect mm. angles, airtight. Um, and so they're still excavating that, but there's remnants of these megalithic walls. And as they dig in further, they look like the other ones that you see around the world. Are there a lot of them and are they uh, sort of like perimeters of what could have been a town or something? Are there any sort of like structure to them or are they just random bits of wall? They only, they've only dug one wall so far and Easter oh. Island has barely been touched mm -hmm. in terms of archaeology. I mean, they just started to find out not so long ago that the, um, the Moa statues have bodies. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that was yeah, that was very recent. Do you know what I want to do as well? I want to take a boat and do some diving around the waters around there because oh, I guarantee yeah. you they yeah. are going to find stuff. Oh yeah, definitely, mm. definitely. So, um, so check Easter Island follows the folklore. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, great Easter Island. That is going to be a good one. And Easter Island, I I'm talking to like. Um, elders of the Lee Society Islands and of the Marshall Islands and, and different islands of the Polynesia uh, rim. And um, there isn't much folklore around Easter Island. So I, I'm really trying to uncover ancient folklores um, mm. to try to document it um, around these pyramids and megaliths, you know, all around Asia and the Pacific Islands before they completely get forgotten. So if you know anybody in the Easter Islands who knows some folklores around around them, please let me know. Uh -huh. um, so then anyways, that's Easter Island. So then I hit to Hawaii, okay? And um, I'm like, all right, so if this folklore is, let's see how folklore is true or not. So there's got to be a pyramid in Hawaii. And I think I know Hawaii. I go to Hawaii quite a bit. So I know Hawaii. I have cousins that live in Hawaii. I'm like, yeah, let's see. I, I've never heard of a pyramid in Hawaii. So I go to Hawaii, and there is a pyramid in Hawaii. Is there? There's a pyramid. It's called the Wanea Pyramid in oh, Hawaii. W-A-I-A-N-A-E. But, I, I, like, okay, so our, our definition of pyramid has changed somewhat in the last 20 years, I would say, and since the Bosnian pyramids, because... It doesn't necessarily have to be a perfect like. It could be a step or, pyramid. It could be a you know, but um, this one it, it fits the structure of a typical pyramid of mathematical proportions. Everything now it's yeah, in a remote part. It's in Wanea area. It's in a remote part of Hawaii, so you have to you know really trek to get out there. Okay. But, whereas all of these pyramids and megaliths typically are in remote areas away from current civilization, so you you have to 
take a bit of an excursion. But the Wanea Pyramid in Hawaii is there. Now, the folklore, the Hawaiian folklore, um, actually has a folklore that actually attributes it to Lemuria. So um, they actually, according to their folklore, um, their ancient chiefs were this, um, were kind of like refugees of Lemuria, and they came here and they settled and they tried to restart the civilization. And their tribes, um, elders were the chiefs and their chiefs are very, very large. That's the folklore. So they actually um, have a folklore that, that gives credit to Lemuria. So that's Hawaii. So check mm -hmm. Hawaii, yeah, check, check for Hawaii. Okay. So then I go to the next island. I'm going down the folklore. I'm not even, I'm not making any uh, biases. I'm just going down the folklore. The Buddhist folklore about the mega flood over 10,000 years ago, um, about the possible civilization of Lemuria. So I go to New Zealand. And in New Zealand, I'm like, <laughs> New Zealand's pretty remote. So, so am I gonna find anything in New Zealand? And yes, I found something in New Zealand. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, the Kama Nawa wall mystery in New Zealand. Yeah, and the stone spheres. You know about the stone spheres, the boulders on the beach. You know about that. You know, there's, there's, and I also I was contacted by somebody who's invited me to New Zealand to go and film down there. It says that there's loads of megaliths, and it's it's on my list of things to do, but it's quite a long oh my list. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah, if you can dive in a lot of these sites, um, you want to dive. You want yeah. to dive. A lot of these sites are underwater. Um, does, and so, does Japan is that included in your um, research? I'm going down. The, I'm going to get there too. I'm oh, you there. started at the north. I thought I thought you'd forgotten. Oh, Japan. Yeah, I, I start, I, yeah, I think I, I think I, cause I, it's just a, uh, I um, I, I think I kind of like jump around a little bit yeah, yeah but i'm trying to, yeah but I, i'm following the rim i'm trying to follow the the, the folklore all the way down the pacific isles so right. i think i jump around a little bit in my memory here um but so anyways new zealand yes they they got the, now the thing with new zealand is i cannot for the life of me find folklores um and so if anybody has folklores around the tribes that lived in ancient times around these megaliths yeah, um, particularly like, okay. particularly if they're masturbating statues, I guess, <laughs> right? <laughs> at least they had at least they had humor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, God, we're <laughs> so doomed if we don't. Anyways, I, you know, it's really hard to find tribes people of New Zealand to tell me folklore, but I am, I'm all ears to to collect those folklore. So you. that's that's New Zealand. Now, I I forgot to talk about um, another Polynesian island. I think it was in Samoa, it's called for Nan, Nan Madal. Nan Madal, which is a um, megalithic um, community on the coral um, edge of their island. And um, it's basically these big megalithic structures that kind of stacked up and they made this basically this community. Um, and you can, it's called Nan Madal. Where's this? This is on an island in the, in the Pacific. In the Pacific, yeah, in the Polynesian rim. Are these megalithic though? They look like they're a little bit smaller, the, the size of the stones and things. They are megalithic. Um, there's more pictures of it. Mm. They, um, they actually did some sonar and they saw most of the um, communities underwater. Mm. But there is still megalithic um, parts of the city um, above water on the edge of the island. And the island is not really heavily populated, um, but the folklore, there's a folklore around Nan Madal in this island, um, this Polynesian island. And the folklore is that um, there, there's two folklore. One folklore was there was some, there was a, some ships of seafaring people mm -hmm. that landed in this part of the island and they were very tall. And they created this community for themselves and they settled into the area. And then over time, they um, started to acclimate to the local area with the people and, you know, have children with the local people. And over time, they got shorter. But much of the chiefs of this island are descendants of the original inhabitants that created Namadal. That's the first folklore. The second folklore was that there was two giant brothers that settled on the island. They were seafaring. They had... Um, landed on the island 
and they built an animal doll. And then they, um, one of the brothers died, the other brother ended up um, marrying and having children with local, a local woman. And then, of course, the chiefs of the islands were descendants of him. So two different folklores for how Nan Madal was created. But aside from that, they don't know anything about how this is created. The locals say, we didn't create it. It was the ancient chiefs. Yeah, and this is quite wow. a story as well. Like I, I've never heard of this, and I'm quite ashamed of myself, to be honest with you, because I'm seeing like there's stories in mainstream newspapers in England, and they're saying this, the headline for this one is Mysterious Ancient City Found on a Remote Island sends conspiracy theorists wild as they're convinced Atlantis has finally been found. You know, like that's in the Sun newspaper in England, which is basically about football and bullshit entertainment, you know? So it seems like the story has really gone that this could be, they're calling it sunken city, an ancient city in Atlantis. So this is actually real deal stuff, isn't it? You know? Yeah, so it's a big lift city, and they don't really know too much about it, but they do have these folklores from the tribes people. Now, I sent you a picture um, some, uh, when I was talking to um, some elders of different Fiji um, tribes. They sent me some pictures of some of the chiefs that they've had. Mm -hmm. So I sent you a picture of Chief um, Kalanova of Fiji, and he is seven feet, seven inches tall. Blonde hair, blue um, eyes? No, but actually, some of the Polynesian folklores of the ancient chiefs had blonde hair or red hair, the mm. really, really old ones. Right. Okay. okay. I'm around 40% Polynesian, so maybe there's something to that folklore of uh, about the ancient Lemurians being um, blonde, blue-eyed Asians. Maybe. We don't know. But anyways, so um, the, the Fiji chief, um, Chief Kaliova, he's seven feet, seven inches tall. And he is, um, he's actually a pastor now, um, you know, taking care of his people through the church. Um, and he denounced his chief status. And then um, over in the Lao Islands um, of Fiji as well, um, the, as sent you a picture of Chief Tua or Tuina, and he is, um, I think he's almost eight feet tall as well. He's a very, very large guy. And all these chiefs, these older generation chiefs of these Polynesian islands are, according to their folklore, are smaller versions of the ancient ones that settled in their islands a long, long time ago off of boats. Um, and so what you have is you have chiefs that are almost eight feet or so tall. So, um, now in, in, I also got sent some pictures from different people in China cause I'm making my way up to China and I talked to different, um, representatives of different associations and they're like, you know, we've had giants here too. Um, who has been part of our society. And um, you have in China, uh, Mr. Chang Wu Gao of China, and he was um, like seven feet, nine inches tall. Yeah, and most of these are chiefs in the Polynesian Islands or their um, lineage to some kind of royalty in China. Okay. Um, you know, like Yao Ming of the Houston Rockets. Um, he's about seven feet, six inches tall. Very nice guy. Um, you have um, Sun Ming Ming, who is also an NBA player. Um, and he is seven feet, nine inches tall. And his wife is six feet, six inches tall. Yeah. So, so you think that this is confirmation of some of the folklore stories? You think this is like... The, the I don't descendants... have an opinion. Okay. I don't have an opinion. I just, I just document folklore and just tell it how it is. Cool. So, um, so according to the folklore with these giant Asians, they are supposed to be descendants of royalty right. from royal lineage. Mm -hmm. um, as far back, we don't know. It would be very interesting to do some DNA testing on these uh, individuals, I would think. Yeah, it would be very interesting. Mm. Um, so, so, that, so I went to Ze New Zealand, and so then I go to Australia, and I'm like, okay, I'm just following the Buddhist folklore about the mega flood over 10,000 years ago from Lemuria and the plight of, of the survivors. And I go to Australia, and uh, of course, I find there's a pyramid in Australia called the Gimpy Pyramid. Gimpy. And it has the Gosford hieroglyphs on it, which is very controversial. 
of how these Gosford Egyptian hieroglyphics end up on a small pyramid structure in Australia, and they don't know anything about it. And I'm having a really hard time locating folklores around Australia and around these megaliths as well. So some of these islands, like the Polynesian islands um, in Asia, have really good um, records of their folklores because they tell them. But some of these other areas are so remote and so um, removed from the folklores of telling story that they've forgotten or it's just completely gone. So I would mm. love to, to find somebody who still has folklore um, somewhere in these areas. Okay, so that's a shout out for anyone watching this who yeah. knows anything about these things. This Gimpy Pyramid looks interesting also. It's in Australia and they have the Gosper hieroglyphs. Right. Okay, yeah. um, yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, so I, that's I, I just need to... I apologize for this. I think we might, because this is just so much information. I think we might have to do a second interview. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not sure if people are aware, but I actually live in like a motor home and I'm going to have to go and park somewhere. And I've been teaching science all day to some horrible little kids. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I had one kid today who handcuffed himself to the table. <laughs> and then he, he wouldn't show me where the key was. Uh, so, I, um, I know I know you're suffering <laughs> yeah yeah oh god it was a hell of a day I'll be honest with you so um what I, I, I'd say if we've got about another 15 minutes um and I'd like to ask you a few questions um and I know you've got so much more I'm looking at the list of stuff you sent me and you've got so much information and it's it's awesome it's awesome well, I, I think a lot of this no, we can we can edit this video uh and, and this out so Go, we park your car and come back. I'd save you plenty of time. I'd say, honestly, just we'll just put this out there and then we can go into more detail. We can we can just do another one anytime. Okay. We'll see how this one goes. See if you get any response to it. Um, and then we'll just do, we can even, I can just delete this one and we'll just do another better one and I can be much more prepared for it and we can have photos or something like that. But, yeah, let's um, try that. We could try that because you want to get to the information from Russia, China, the Nazis. Yeah. Well, I think um, a lot of a lot of the, so mo most of my viewers and subscribers are really well informed about all of these things. So I think the Russia they would know about. You're talking about the massive megalithic walls in Russia, I imagine, right? Yeah. Which links to lots of places around the world. And the, this is what I like to do. This is this is my kind of like mission is to show links from all of these places around the world. So this is really perfect. And. Um, you know, as you said, there's links to, uh, from Easter Island to Peru to Russia, and then you've got pyramids all over the place. And it's just the amount of evidence now is getting so overwhelming that the mainstream. Well, I haven't gone to Samoa. I haven't gone to Papua New Guinea. I haven't gone to um, Korea. Has forty five thousand domains. Yeah, well, I actually got, I'm, I've had so many different numbers, but there's certainly a lot, isn't there? Like I've been saying, thirty-five thousand. But I, to be honest, I hope you're right. <laughs> I hope there's forty-five. Yeah, it's just thousands of dollars. There's a lot. <laughs> Korea, oh, Korea, God, yeah. and then China. I haven't gone to China. I haven't gone to Mount Kailash. Pyramids um, in China. And yeah, yeah. It's just going. The, but do you have one, a website? Um. Yeah, I do have a website. I, I, I think I sent you. It's called macabachakras.com, but I haven't put um, my research on the tribal folklores I've been collecting around megaliths and pyramids on okay. that. Um, but you know that a lot of that is research from my other book series that I'm finishing up, which is Buddhist Mandalas: okay. Tribes of Awakening with Sacred Geometry. Oh, which, awesome. Yeah, which I um, actually tie in and explain sacred geometry in all spiritual traditions going back to 13,000 years ago. Wow, that's brilliant. That's really good. So, yeah. A signed copy, please. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I would love to, it's no problem. <laughs> So, so basically, I hate to do this to you and summarize your work, but it's, it's basically you've followed the folklore and you've looked for evidence on all of these specific islands, Pacific islands, um, and you found a lot of evidence to back up some 100%. of the folklore. 100% of the and islands. 100%, really? You haven't found 100%. an island where there was no ancient sites? Wow. I basically, I basically said, okay, this is the Buddhist folklore that's in uh, my mother's... Uh, Buddhist artwork in her uh, monasteries and in others throughout Southeast Asia about this mega flood. Mm -hmm. And according to this Buddhist folklore, all these islands in the Pacific all the way through Asia should have a megalith for a pyramid if these 
ancient giant ones, we built their culture. Mm. And I just basically just went from the top of what would be Lemuria, the Polynesian islands, and it went to the big ones, the biggest islands, and, and then dot around some of the smaller islands. And every single big one I've gone all the way down, all the way to Yunaguni in Japan, has a pyramid of some sort and megalith. And mm. usually has a folklore around the ancient ones. Well, that's an incredible statement in itself to say that hundred percent of them, and and it's brilliant What's that the you're likelihood that I'm going to find that. Yeah, What's not the likelihood. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's not very high, is it? Um, <laughs> but, me too, it's me. And it's great you're using you're basically using the folklore as a map or like a treasure map to find the site. So that's it, that's awesome. Um, one of the things I really wanted to ask you: Have you heard of the work of David Talbot and the Electric Universe? He sounds familiar. Because he about. he has done a very similar thing to yourself, um, and he has taken all of the mythology, ancient mythology, um, and uh, the reason I like him is because he's basically put it all together and taken out the common um, stories or common features from a lot of the stories. Um, which kind of for me is a way of getting rid of this like word of mouth Chinese whispers idea like if you're taking it from a hundred different sources then it's probably likely to be true right so he has done that he, did, he spent probably 30 years doing it and he has come up with some incredible information um, so I really recommend having a quick look at his work yes um, yes I would definitely look at his work you know it's funny because as I go down the I follow the Buddhist folklore about the mega flood and I go down the Polynesian islands and wrap up into Asia, up to Siberia, and then all the way down to you know, do a nice little full circle. I do fall into, and I'm, I'm holding off that information on those folklores for my Europe book because I fall into Atlantis folklores. Okay. Um, a lot of the Polynesian and the Asian folklores keep on pointing back to an ancient advanced civilization of Lemuria. And then as I cross into the mouth, the, you know, past Tibet, I start getting into folklores about Atlantis and diaspora from that ancient advanced civilization. But I'm holding that off until I finish Asia. Okay, is there, is there anything in the folklore um, that suggests that Lemuria was a kind of, um, what should we call it civilization or or territory for reptilian aliens and the atlantis was more sort of nordic pleiadian types and that they were fighting i know there's a lot of like fighting in the folklore have you heard anything to back that up um i have not okay. um so some of these folklores like the folklore of um laos indonesia philippines um, and the Polynesian islands start circling back to the same, even though these islands are completely separate from one another, they have folklores of, this, of the ancient ones of these megalithic cultures who are really, really giant and tall. Mm. Um, that keeps to be a recurring thing that I keep coming, coming through. Um, the other thing is a lot of the spiritual symbolism in some of the artifacts keep going back to enlightenment. So, uh, which, you know, which I can explain um, in another segment. Do they say that the megaliths were used to help the Enlightenment? Because that's one thing that I kind of notice is that psychic or paranormal occurrences or abilities tend to be increased around these um, these ancient sites. Is there anything to suggest that they were using them to help Enlightenment? Well, um, according to some of the, the locos, when you are meditating in some of these places, you will have a surreal experience because there's higher energies. Mm. Okay. so like if you go to the pyramids of these different sites and you meditate um you will have more um kind of a vision quest that's what some of them say so many times they would do um spiritual rituals at these ancient sites because they believe that it it amplifies vision quests so that's very suggestive of that then isn't it that these sites yeah so yeah so and that's why that's why like when you go to the pyramids of the philippines or the or to um different megalithic structures in easter island and many of these other places many of the younger or the newer 
cultures that's come through the areas will still build their churches and build um, ritual around the ancient sites because they believe those ancient sites have higher residents. And that's such a common thing around the world of all of these sites, the church is going on yeah, top of these. Yeah, so I'm collecting the folklores and I'm kind of going, and, and it's interesting because some of these folklores, um, they play to each other. Some of these folklores really point to the same <clears> thing. <throat> Um, that they're and the and the interesting about Russia and the Ural Mountains is that um, they found evidence of um, even much older civilizations than thirteen thousand years ago um, mm -hmm. as well, and so they may even be more ancient, advanced civilizations on Earth than just the folklores of Lemuria or Atlantis. Oh, cool! Well, I mean, the Olmecs. The Olmecs are pretty much. Uh... The oldest we know, I would think, aren't they? I, I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think they're over yeah. 30,000 years old or something. Well, yeah, the Olmecs, I, I'm, I'm saving, I got some Olme the, I got some folklores that I've collected from the Olmecs, and the Olmecs, I'm saving that for the book series on the Americas, because okay. um, the folklores that I'm getting from native tribes in the Americas come from um possible civilization in the atlantic and then a possible possible civilization in the pacific so the americas yeah. might be according to the folklores um a divergence of two different megalithic cultures oh okay interesting maybe that's just a, that's just the folklore i've collected so far so i reserve any opinion period i just tell folklore mm -hmm. but some of these folklores support each other yeah, yeah. And the material around these folklore support the folklores. Was it, so you just said that, that there was evidence um, of an older civilization. What kind of evidence was that? Was that folklore again? Or was there, um, I mean, there's the yeah. pyramid in Indonesia, obviously, but um, was there anything else to that? Well, you know, um, like I live here in Seattle and we have geological evidence from, I sent, I sent you a picture, um, it's called Palouse Falls Park. Mm -hmm. And it's based, it looks like the Grand Canyon. And there's a picture of me um, sitting in front of the top of the of Blues Falls. And basically, um, according to geology reports, about there was a lot of Ice Age floods, but the biggest one went from Montana all the way through Washington. So half of, um, of the United States had this big Ice Age flood. And it was so powerful um, that it carved out a whole mountainside to make it look like the Grand Canyon, all the way up to eastern Washington in um, Palouse Falls, and then just carved it out and then just created this little circle area, amphitheater, and then it just went off and then just kind of the waters receded. And in that picture I sent you is actually, I, when I went there, I tried to take a helicopter tour to go see the Scablands of Eastern Washington. And it was just the wrong timing. So I, so I ended up just taking the river, the river tour, but I could just see the hillsides, but I couldn't see the aerial view. So I sent you a picture of the aerial view and that's like citywide and it's huge. And it basically looks, like a geological evidence of an ice age flood that kind of melted and receded down into the Columbia River. So we know geologically from the evidence that 13,000 years ago, there was an ice age flood that carved out mountains and sides mm -hmm. and took out huge areas. And we have the evidence today. Yeah, Hancock. Half of the United States that was in a flood. So that kind of major flood that melts and takes out half of the United States may be the type of flood that takes out these ancient advanced folklore civilizations. Yeah, can be, right? Maybe, Great some smaller, maybe some other smaller, you know, leftover ice age floods after that, but that was the biggest one that we have geological evidence and you can see it. Mm. Brilliant stuff, isn't it? And it's funny too, because when I was collecting folklores, in Laos, all the monks would say, over 10,000 years ago, way, way over 10,000 years ago was the flood. When I go to the um, Polynesian islands, they have folklores of their ancient um, chiefs men coming in about 12,000 years ago. So everybody kind of points to the same, almost the same time frame. Mm. Fascinating stuff, isn't it, to be honest with you? We're in a really exciting period of... Uh... Yeah, archaeology is, 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 you know, for me... Um, for me, getting thrown into this interest from um, from my my trip to Laos to see the monasteries my mother 
um, helps the construction and renovation of into looking at these folklores. I kind of went further down the rabbit hole and they started to collect folklore after folklore. And now I'm like, well, I'm already in it. So I might as well <laughs> keep collecting them all and then mm -hmm. put them into a book because I'm a book writer. So I'll, I'll put them in the book and just tell it how the locals tell the folklore. And then, you know, many of these tribes are, um, are slowly fading out through mm -hmm. modernization and as a result of that um it, you know and again modernization just assimilation and as a result of that the, their their oral tradition of telling story slowly starts fading out that's why i can typically get more stories and folklores from the polynesian islands than i do the major um countries in the in the asia because they've mm -hmm. kind of assimilated over time unless they're really still rather tribal like Laos. Mm -hmm. But um, the ones that really modernize, there's less and less folklore. So I would like to collect as many folklores and get those accurate and put it in the canon. So maybe in the future as technology gets better, like line art gets better, and maybe we have line art underneath the water and we can see all the pyramids and structures underneath the water as deep as we want. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever the technology happens to evolve to, they will look at these folklores and go, okay, according to this folklore, let's see what's down here. And so um, at the very least, before these tribes completely lose their stories, I would like to document it. Well, good for you. It's great work uh, and needs to be done. Um, I'm, as I said on the beginning of this, that um, I don't know many people out there doing much work about the the Lemurian sort of part of the planet, really. So it's great. You've, you've introduced me to a host of sites and there's going to be more, I know. Yeah, um, as, as tides go up, water levels go up, these Polynesian islands will go down. Yeah over yeah. time so we can at least keep the literature of their folklores alive somehow yeah and we need to go to these places and video them too mm -hmm. if they get mm -hmm. destroyed we can have some video to watch which yeah not the yeah. same but it's better than nothing go underwater just like yunaguna is underwater and the funny thing about yunaguna in japan because japan's you know, Guna underwater is a big, large step pyramid. And when they've been doing dives and excavations, they, they found it about 10 years ago. When they've been doing dives and excavations, the steps of these pyramids are three or four or five times larger than the divers. And so they've come to the conclusion that Yunaguna's, the Japan's underwater pyra step pyramid, Isn't was it Yonaguni? It was not made for normal people, it was made for giants. This isn't it Yonaguni or is yeah, Yonaguni. It? Yeah, Yonaguni. Okay. Oh, right. and, I just didn't know and, if I was pronouncing it wrong. Yeah, I know. And in the surrounding area of that pier underwater pyramid, there are megaliths all over. Oh god, yeah. Japan is really high up on my list of places to go to actually, and I want to go dive in there. I mean, yeah. you're right. There's also channels, and there's like a star on a flat platform, and there's all sorts of uh, really interesting things there, isn't there? So. Yeah, you know, archaeology has definitely found a surge. And the thing is, is that archaeology nowadays is not like the archaeology of the past. You mm. need, um, you need, there's a lot of different disciplines that kind of go into it. You need, like, anthropology, you need storytellers, you need um, tech, a lot of tech. You need oh, yeah. biologists, you need geologists, you, of course, you need archaeologists, you need linguists. I mean, there's so many different disciplines that have to come in to look at this. Um, I, as I was doing this interview, I got people going, hey, look at this place in my area. And I had somebody from South Africa send me Adam's calendar, which is a 100,000-year-old Stonehenge mm. in South Africa. Yeah, we but made a video about it. There's a video yeah. on our YouTube channel. I was there. Yeah. So I, was I was there like, for a couple oh, of months. There's pyramids I there. There's millions of stone circles they're not megalithic yeah. but there's at least one site that's megalithic yeah look exactly. at my video it's really cool actually yeah yeah i, yeah, I like I like, and that's why i reached out to you but um, there's just so many and so the story as you start going through this it just there's they just one after another after another after mm. another just start like building and building and it's just kind of like okay you know what um we need to look at these stories yeah oh hell yeah and we are humanity is joining hands and we are really looking at these yeah, we need to look at these stories and we need to start with different eyes yeah, yeah we need to have fresh eyes and so they're looking at a story because 
humanity, according to these pyramids, megaliths, and tribal folklores all over the world, are saying very similar things. And many of these cultures are completely remote and they don't, don't talk to each other. But they're saying very similar things. Yeah. Um, and we need to start looking beyond 6,000 years ago and start seeing that maybe humanity is much more interesting than we give ourselves credit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I completely agree, and I think we are in the process of doing that, are we not? Which is yeah. awesome. Um, I've got to go. I'm, I'm really <laughs> sorry. I'm really sorry. Like, I, I have to go and park up my van and and get into bed. I'm probably going to have about two minutes to relax tonight. But <laughs> well, thank you so much for thank helping you. me get the word out. Thank and again, you for well. your audience, if they know any folklore leads or you know elders or organizations let yeah. me know Put it on the comments and i will search that and that's all i need i just i just need to know the names i can follow okay. the link excellent and they can contact me i'm very much online and contactable so if they want to get to you they can come through me i'll filter everyone for you save uh save you getting all the trolls <laughs> um but yeah thank you also it's been wonderful um I think we're going to do this again. I'm pretty sure I enjoyed this more than I thought I would do. So I'm probably going oh, to start. Good. Yeah, no, he's brilliant. And you've been a real, like, you might be the person that's pushed me into starting to interview people to do with these megaliths. So um, if that's the case and I continue to do this, then we're, I'm having you back on if, if you're willing to. Oh, yeah. And we'll do it properly and we'll go into more depth about what you're doing and, and we'll cover all the other sites that we didn't get to. And again, I apologize, but. Uh, there you go. It's just the way I live at the moment in a van. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, my love. We will do this again. And thank you so much for the opportunity. You're welcome. Very, very welcome. Yeah. Kudos to you. And we'll see you again. All right. Bye. Bye.